How many believe the Lord's helping you already? Amen. Amen. Six. We haven't hit this in a while. You know what my problem is part of the time is I just assume too much. No, I'm serious. I assume people read this and read that, and know this and know that. But what I've come to understand with life and, and just in general is that things have to be reinforced over and over and over and over and over. You know what I mean? It's like anything in life, isn't it? How many know about math? If, if you don't practice math on a regular basis, it kind of dwindles in one sense. It's got to be something you, you, you use on a regular basis. And so uh, it's good to be reminded of these things. So what I want to do is this. I'm going to remind, because I believe to get through these days that you and I are living in, you're going to need to be saturated with the love of God for your personal life. I'm not, I'm not even talking about you loving other people. See, many times we try to teach people to love others, but the problem is, is you can't love anybody in, until you first have experienced love in your own walk. Do you understand that? Until you see things in a right size, in a right perspective, you won't be able to look. If you don't understand that God's forgiven you and in many areas of life and continues, you won't be a very forgiving person. Do you know that? And here's the truth. The truth is this, is that lots of people that struggle with, with unforgiveness, it's, it's just a nothing but a, but a form of pride. It's all it is, a form of pride and selfishness. They're saying, I know better than the Lord. Amen. They say, I know more than the Lord. And nobody has, uh, got, and nobody has experienced torment, uh, abuse, uh, unloyalty uh, uh more than the lord jesus and the father god you understand he's dealt with humanity for a long time and imagine how merciful gracious and loving he is imagine that how he's dealt with uh perpetual rebellion uh resistance uh people being hard-hearted people doubting which is the worst you know, every, every core issue that people deal with today is just doubt. Why do people not forgive? Because they don't, they don't believe. They believe their problem, their challenge, the offense that happened to them is greater than what the scriptures teach about Jesus and about God the Father. They, they, they have more invested in their own experience than God's experience. Amen? And people will say, you, you don't understand what they did to me or what they've done or what they're doing. It, it doesn't really matter. It don't. It matters to them. But in the kingdom of God, it, it doesn't matter at all. How many of you know that? There's nowhere that the Lord's ever going to say, you know what? You, you, you know what? You were raped and beaten down. You, you, you know, these bad things did happen to you. But he's not going to dismiss the fact that his life in you affords them an opportunity to be forgiven how many of you understand that and something that happens in america is this we deal with different issues so i don't want to minimize it but there's a lot of people i want to tell you a good movie you should watch it's a christian movie it's called end of the spear end of the spear like s-p-a-r that's a powerful movie it's really true i mean and if we look at even the christian community uh many of them in, in the first century, when, when uh, Saul became Paul, and he went back amongst the believers. Amen? He had did a lot of damage, wreaking havoc in the church. Killed the Stephen, others. I mean, so, I mean, I wonder how many Christians would receive him today. I mean, serious. How many, how many, you know, uh, here's a good example. It'd be like, uh, if you think about it, like that guy that went in and shot all those Christians in that church, like a number of years back in North Carolina or something, killed the pastor, shot him down, cold blooded in the pulpit and everything else. And a couple of Christians at a Bible study. And I think the pastor, I don't know if it was the wife or family members. They said, we, we forgive that man. See, that's foreign to the natural mind, isn't it? But to the man or woman of God, that's lifestyle. If you're truly walking with him, there's nothing that he's going to allow you ever to hold. Now, I realize there's a time of processing. 
There's a time of, you know, going through some things. But ultimately, if you're walking with him, he walks you out in the victory, doesn't he? He'll walk you out. So Philippians 1 in verse 6, it says, being confident in this very thing, he which hath begun a good work, what? What will he do? Help me out. He'll complete it. He'll bring it to full maturity. Now, what work is he talking about? I'm just saying, he that begun the good work, right? So religion is people trying to work out their stuff. They're trying to work and become more holy, more righteous, more pure. They're trying to not sin. They're trying to be better. They're trying to do good. There goes that word again, be better. Just be better. They're trying not to, you know, even in the modern society today, people are trying to not be racist. See, all the things that go on in the world, and that's what the devil's doing now. You got all these things going on. I was hearing something the other day about, uh, you know, there's now there's racism against uh, Chinese people, and there's racism against this, and there's racism against that, and there's rape. And I think every culture, how about the Japanese back after World War II in San Francisco? Every culture, the Irish who came here at one point, Jews, Blacks, every race, even I'll tell you this, this is pretty hard too, because they have a stigma. Do you know Germans face a lot of racism? Because of Hitler. I mean, have you ever met a German person? And you always think, wow, man, I wonder if you believed in that. Because, you know, the whole country went sideways, didn't they? The whole country, Hitler convinced them all. So you just wonder, was your grandparent a, you know, a Nazi, you know, or whatever, or your forefather? I mean, imagine having to live like that with that kind of history. But what I'm saying is these are all external things that society tries to deal with. They'll never fix it, man. They can't fix it. The only thing that can fix anything is the power of the love of God. Do you understand that? And I'm just using those as examples. I don't waste my time because I already know, but I just find it hilarious how the natural man is trying to fix everything in life. And a lot of Christians that are on board with it, they're on board with politics, they're on board with uh, racial issues, they're on board with COVID, they're on board with this, they're on board with everything except what they should be on board with, which is the word of God. So anyway, he says, being confident is a very good thing. He begun a good work. We'll complete it. So what I want to just talk about is you basking in God's love and you just cultivating so strong for you. Listen to this, for you. So that you stay insulated from the toxicity, from the, the, the smooth little baitings that are coming through media, Facebook, Twitter, news people, Christians, non-Christians. Because there's a lot of Christians and non-Christians, they're all streaming their opinions, and that's all they are, is opinions. Do you understand? And so a lot of Christians get hoodwinked, man. They get hoodwinked because they're not in the Word. They're not in the Word, and they know of the love of God, but they don't know it with a personal encounter. Because a personal encounter goes home and forgives when a bro beats you over the head with a gun. Personal encounter forgives when someone's lied and dece deceived or hurt you. Come on. I, I, there's nothing anybody could do to me that I can hold a grudge towards. I can't. How can I hold animosity and a grudge toward anybody? How? I got the love of God in me. I can't shut that off because I'm born again. He begun a good work in me. He's all the while at work to will and do of his good pleasure. The question is, a lot of people go to church, but they don't let the Holy Ghost do his will. Like Brother Mark said, they have him tied up and gagged and put in the basement. He can't work because they, they won't let him work. But he wants to work. God didn't give you the Holy Spirit so he can tag around on your belt loop. He's not supposed to be one following you. You supposed to be following him. He guides you into all truth. He didn't ask you for your leadership. Trust me. We saw where your leadership got us, Adam. 
and Eve, or Eve and Adam, right? And and, and the reality is, uh, you know, we can't blame. You know why? You know why? Uh, you know why uh, Adam gets blamed for the rebellion? Because when Eve came with the fruit, Adam was supposed to put her in check. He was supposed to say, "No, no, hold on a sec here. Where'd you get that? That ain't gonna work." Don't bring that around here. That's not God. Where'd you get that? And Adam should have marched right down and found the source where it came from and exercised his authority. But we don't know the conversation that went on between Adam and Eve. We just know somehow he partook. Somehow his barrier was broke down, right? His guard was let down. He yielded. So it says, it says by one man came in. Didn't say by one woman. By man. Because Adam was put in charge. Now, we got a lot of women here. Praise God for the women. But understand this. Woman came out of a man. Man didn't come out of a woman. So although they're co-equal in marriage, how many understand? There is a position and 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 a and a rank by God. Amen. Spiritually speaking. Amen. Not hey, you do what I say, and I you know, you know that's that's not what we're talking about. That's that's ungodly. Because actually the Bible tells you if you were to read Ephesians 5, how how a relationship is to work, right? Amen. That's how a relationship is supposed to work. Okay, so like Jesus. Christ is head of the church. Does the Lord make you do anything? No, he don't. You know what? He wants you to yield in, exercise faith. So here you go. Let me just read in a couple minutes here. We saturate. I want to go to Ephesians uh, 1. Go to Ephesians 1. I got some verses. Your identity and, and, and record. See, if you had this truth in you, you joyful every day. I'm being honest. I see a lot of Christians, they're not happy. And the reason why, see, when you feed on this truth, it, 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 it engrafts itself into your system. For instance, like uh, there's a guy yesterday, I forget his name. His son was training with Josh and he's going to be on the same baseball team for summer. And he goes, oh man, perhaps we can share some rides, you know? these trips i go forget rides how about we share some trips because the team only goes to oregon arizona los angeles uh, uh colorado they, they don't play here they go around the united states so i said perhaps we can share some trips you know and and so um as we were talking he went to put his kind of hand out and he didn't know if he should put his hand out or give me a bump and i was like here, bro, it's all good. I'm COVID free. You know, and then I and then we started talking and I said, I'm comfortable. And then, you know, which I'm call and I said, I'm COVID free. I said, first off, you know, I'm a person of I, I believe I always say I believe to be a deep man of faith. I don't run around and tell people I'm a deep man of faith. You know, just say you believe to be right, because you believe you're a deep man of faith or a deep woman of faith. But only God can answer that. Because he says, who can find a faithful man or a faithful woman? So the point I'm saying is this. So I said, but also on top of that, I've been taking six, 7,000 milligrams of vitamin C for almost 28 years every day. And I just upped the ante. And then my friend from Pasquale, he's one of the owners, like, hey, man, did you ever know about vitamins? Uh, vitamin, uh, I think he said D3 or something. He's like, it's like sunlight. He's like, you should add that to your diet. And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. So I added that. But I eat a lot of oranges and limes and everything else anyway. My point is, is this, there's my whole point to all that. It's not to say I'm COVID free. It's to say it's in the system. Get it? It's working in the system. You do it long enough, it gets in there. It becomes a part of you. How many of you know what I'm saying? You get the word in there like this verse right here. Ephesians 1. It's a juicy verse that all of us should feed on on a regular basis. Ephesians 1, let's see where are we at, verse 4. I was going to get, uh, uh, I'm going to, the King James says, uh, according to he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, 
that we would be holy without blame before him in love. Now, the Amplified says this. In his love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we'd be consecrated, set apart before him, blameless in his sight, above reproach, before him in love. Come on. Before him in love. Like, look at uh, Patrick right here. When Patrick looks at, well, forget you, man. I got to look at my son. <laughs> no. But Patrick looks at his son, and somehow, does he see any fault in this young boy? Come on now. I know your mind tells you this. This is what, and I'm not against you. Just show me that you really care about this message. Otherwise, we'll finish up and go home and you can have a sandwich. I know a lot of people that go, yeah, yeah, that's great. But see, that's how I live life. That's how I see myself. Sorry. Like somebody told me the other day, they're like, I really experienced the love of God. It's like, I experienced that every day for 28 years. Every day. But I'll tell you, I experienced. That's why I don't need no dope. I don't need no liquor. I don't need more money. I, I, I got something inside that you can't buy at the store. And you say, well, well, you know, and that bugs some people because they've been in church for a while. And they, but, but see, you didn't want that. You got to sow into that. See, I don't need like all the other stuff in life. I don't. That's why I'm still here preaching, even to a small crowd. I can go anywhere in the United States and get a job at a bigger church. I can. That's the truth. I stay here because like I told this guy, this police officer, sergeant, and they, I said, I stay in the city and I live here because of the people in the church. And my son lives here too, you know, but I mean, and, and, and the group of guys that I, I like on Thursday night, I have relation, relationships matter to a lot of people. They don't, they don't, people will throw you to a wayside quickly, but Here's what I've learned in walking with God as a pastor. If they throw me to the wayside, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be who I am. I ought to be who I am in Christ. That's why I experience this on a regular basis. I don't have a lot of highs and lows, you know, and, and there's times where you're not like drinking, like, oh man, this is such a great ride every day. You got to work your relationship, don't you? You got to invest the Lord Jesus. Maybe sometimes the Lord sitting back going. It was date night. But you dated the television. It was date night and you dated the gym. It was coffee time and you didn't want to break with me. You want to break with the world. And don't think anybody in this room hadn't done it. See, I don't lie to myself. I'm like, Lord, yep, mm -hmm. I haven't been fellowshiping with you like I should. And I can see I'm a little dry. And I don't get dry, but I get like, uh, what do you call that? Um, brisk. Like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, I don't get sarcastic. Some people get sarcastic, but I get uh, edgy. You know what I mean? I'm more prone to be like sh sharp. And, and uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You didn't pick that up. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, more abrasive, just intolerant of things when I'm not saturated. And that's not a way to live life. I want to be saturated. I don't want to live up here. See, up here, up here between your ears is always, it's gauging everything. It's like black, white, tiny, Filipino. It's, it's gauging Republican, Democrat. It's, it's scanning every single thing and it's trying to process so much information. <laughs> News, Fox, boop, boop, Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> fear, future. Boop, boop. That's what goes on. You just don't realize it. But your mind is inundated. So when you you saturate with God, you get filled up. But it's up to you. And I'm just saying, and I know none of you do this, but, you know, it's good to come to church, but it's, it's better at home to saturate. You got to stay at the drinking trough. You got to stay at the drinking trough. Let me just tell you this, and I'm not being gross. We're all adults here. What does lack of hydration do to you? Headache. Headache. Like this guy told me the other day, he goes, bro, every time, every time, every time I start feeling bad, I, I, I start drinking water. I start drinking tons of water. He thinks water cures everything. He believes that. He's like, I don't have enough water in me. But let me tell you this. Also, when you're dehydrated, let me ask you, what, 
don't don't freak out. What color is your urine? It's super yellow. It's not good. I'm just telling you, because you know, and that is the evidence that the internals aren't hydrated. They even tell you, like as you get older, I'm not being gross. I just got a test. I got a test kit that came from Kaiser about, you know, as you get up in your 50s and Bernie's laughing. But they want you to send a sample. You get my point? So, okay, we'll leave it. And they said, oh, yeah, your, your stuff looks good. But you should still get checked out anyway. You look good. We don't trace anything. We don't see anything that's, you know, going wrong with your guts. And because as men get up in their 50s, they got to check their backside because they got to make sure they ain't got no cancers, you know, and all that. And so they said it was all good. So they check the internals. They don't come and go, oh man, you look great. You're fine. Why doesn't the doctor just go, hey man, everything's good. You look great. I learned that in college. There was a person that was this lean like Pat and doctor, I, I became friends with him. He taught the health class. He had a body fat thing and he tech. And there was a person that came in and was lean. He goes, that person had over 26 to 28 body fat. Can you believe that? And here I was all chunky and he took mine and mine was like at like 18 or 19 at the time. But you would look at me and think you're fat. But then you look at them, they're skinny, but they had a higher content of body fat. So you can't tell until you look in the internals. So you and I need to be put, this needs to be relative and a part of our inner workings. Amen. Ha ha. So hydration, vitamins, being deposited on the inside. Let me just read a couple more. Look at Mark 3. Go to Mark 3. Hurry up. Mark 3. We're going to get to a couple. Can you take a little more? Come on, Mark 3. I'm telling you, if, you, if you'll roll this up and puff on it a while or drink it and ingest it, I mean, the scripture says, you yeah, bull, you'll be fine. I'm telling you. And matter of fact, if you can't even read and feed and get these revelations in you, the Lord said, I'll give you another way to do it. He said, but you... Uh, beloved build yourself up on your most holy faith doing what praying in the holy ghost praying in other tongues and it can be hard man because your mind but he says praying in the spirit so mark mark uh, what i say mark what mark three and verse i think it's 14 mark three and 14 look what it says mark three and verse 14 and he appointed 12 to continue to what? I'm reading Amplified. He called them to what? Date night. What? Come on. To Say it again. To be with them. Then what? Then what? Then preach. Uh-oh. See, people try to preach, but they ain't been with him. So there you go. You can't preach when you ain't been with them. This ain't Mormon school. You get my point? You go do your duty and you do your religious training and then you get, you no, know, then they appoint you to go somewhere. See, the way the kingdom works is once you're with him, then you get released to do something. When you're with him, why do you got to be with him? So you get the correct understanding. You get the correct experience. Ephesians 3 says that's why you and I are supposed to pray. The Paul Paul said, I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus, whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And actually says, whom the, the fatherhood, whom fatherhood takes its title, is from that father. That he grants you out of rich treasure of his glory, to strengthen what mighty power in the inner man. Christ said, dwell in your heart by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, and able to comprehend length, breadth, and depth, and height. Now, people, can, I can just preach that from a pulpit and go, hey, comprehend the length, breadth, and depth, and height. Look, man, it's going to take you a whole lifetime to really get that, junior. <laughs> get it? It's going to take you a lifetime to comprehend the length, depth, breadth, and the height. As soon as the fear comes, that shows you, you ain't comprehended the length, breadth, depth, and height. Because perfect love casts out fear. And he that's afraid has not reached the full maturity of love. He's not grown into love's complete perfection. There's always something to fear every day. Fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of finances, fear of the dentist, fear of not having enough, fear of not succeeding, fear of failure. They're just all fears. They're just there. But 
the antidote that opposes all those is just put in the right uh, pill. Put in that Ephesians 1, 4 and know that you're chosen. I know this. God has a place for every person in his team. And he never goes, you're better than him. You're the apostle. Oh, you're the apostle and you're just the teacher. See, so many religious people, I just want to slap them. I swear I want to slap them, man. It's like, and God actually tells you in the word that the, the more hidden parts are more valuable. The more hidden. Now, let me tell you this. I, I want to just tell you this. If you think about humanity, What's the most? What's one of the most valuable parts of a woman? I just gave it to you, my God. Just gave you the answer two seconds ago. What's the most valuable part of one of the most valuable parts of a woman? I just gave it to you. I said humanity. No, I clarify her brain. Yeah, okay, that's important. The women are smarter. Women are smarter than men. Sorry, guys, but I'm just proven. But listen to this. Took me a long time to admit that, but they are. I said smarter generally. It doesn't mean they're more spiritual because you're getting the word. So here you go. But listen, um, an important part, one of the most important parts of a woman is her biological system that contains the ovaries. Because without that, there is no reproduction of humanity. And same for a man. So what you think is important may not be as, as important as you think. It's the more hidden parts. How many understand what I'm saying? He see, that's why the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 12, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Now, great example. Thank you. That's why the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm like, I'm amazed at the Holy Spirit myself. I'm like, that's a great example, Lord. I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, the hand can't say to the foot. And as soon as I said the word foot, I thought of my foot or Caleb's foot. And then the Lord just showed me in a millisecond the importance of having a foot. Because I'll tell you, man, it's been five or six months. And on the way over, I screamed picking up Caleb. I, I said, I command these muscles because this foot been hurting. And yesterday I ran the field and made and I forced myself to run. And he can even tell you. The hand can't say to the foot, look, man, this foot has been a hindrance. I've lost thousands of dollars in a degree because I hadn't been able to use this foot properly. I've missed times of enjoyment because I hadn't been able to, I hadn't been able to experience things because of this foot right here. So the hand can't say to the foot, I don't have any need of you. The body works together. So it's all, a lot of times it's things that you don't think, but the reality is, is what he says here is be with him. I mean, that's enough right here to finish and just basically say, I'll give you a couple more verses. Finish, meaning be with him. So if I say, okay, next week you come or Tuesday and you say this, you say this, and, and I, I'm sharing this. For, well, that's not, it's a great analogy, but I'm not going to use it. Like somebody asked me, how much time do I spend with my son? How much time? Now they ask that for a reason to equate something else. But the reality is, is if I say to you by this Tuesday, how much time did you spend with him? By the Tuesday's Bible study, how much time did you spend with him? And if you go, well, I did an hour tonight, an hour on Monday and an hour Tuesday morning. So that meant you did three hours. Let me ask you something. Is three hours enough for you to have a quality relationship with a woman or a man? Is three hours enough time for Sebastian to know your heart and to trust you and to, to listen to his dad's voice? Is three hours enough? That's not a condemnation, but is it? No. And, and you can always say, well, I don't have a lot of time. No, you got 24 hours, but we don't want that. We want to resist that. We want to say, well, I got to work eight hours. I got to make my lunch. I got to do my laundry. I got to do this and I got to do this. And, this. and a lot of times people do this to me. They go, you ain't working right now. You got all kind of time to read the Bible. I hear you. Do you know, though I, I'm not necessarily showing up my union job, 
do you know I have to force myself to find time like you? Because there's all kind of other stuff that just comes that you never planned on before. It's crazy. It's life. So no matter if you're not showing up to a union job for 40 hours a week, you are going to have to fight and make a decision on how to steward and have time management with your time with the Lord. Be with him. Most people's issues today would be solved if they would just be with him. Even when people are with him, they're still on their phone. Have you ever prayed in tongues and been like, go, go, go. You're looking at stuff on Facebook while you're mama, mama, baby, baby. Just keeping it real, you know, to really be with him, it takes a commitment. And the more you're with him, the more you become like him. Amen. And I'm not just talking about like, I don't drink or smoke or do these things anymore. The more you're with him, the more compassionate you become. The more compassionate you become. Because it says Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw them like sheep without a shepherd. Go, go over to, uh, oh, what would be a good one? I got plenty. Go on over to, uh, yeah, go to Exodus 33. And then uh, we'll look at Psalms 27. That'll be it. Exodus 33, Psalms 27. These are just some verses that you already know. But see, here's the thing. It's not what you know. It's what you're eating. It's what you're partaking of on a regular basis. Exodus 33. Let me get there. Uh, I'll give it to you in a minute. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Exodus 33. And doo -doo 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 -doo. verse 7. Now Moses used to take his own tent and he pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. <laughs> Glory to God. The tent of meeting. Notice Moses. Moses said, man, I got to separate myself from the rest of the, the who yows. I need that tent of meeting time. That special time. It's outside the camp far from the camp and everyone who sought the Lord went out that to that temporary tent of meeting which was outside when Moses went out to the tent of meeting all the people rose and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he'd gone into the tent when Moses entered the tent the pillar of cloud would descend notice that when he when he what when he entered and the Lord and, and stood at the door of the tent and the Lord would talk with Moses and the people saw the manifestation or the cloud or the pillar and the people rose up and they worshiped and the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man, as a man speaks to his friend. Uh oh, didn't say the Lord started teaching him. Hey brother, let me give you this doctrine or Hey friend, you've been sinning too much or you shouldn't have stayed out late last night, Kim, or come on. When the Lord begins to speak with you, you know what happens? Here we go. I'm, I'm going to tell you what happens when the Lord speaks to you. You know what you do? You go, you just know. You're like, oh, man, Lord, I need to watch my mouth. I bet some, you don't even realize it till you're in his presence or his word. And then certain things that seem normal to a lot of worldly people can creep in. And all of a sudden in his presence, you're... He's speaking to you like a friend, but his love, his holiness, his righteousness so affects you that all of a sudden you just start coming and be like, look, did you hear what I said? See, we try to get people to come, but the reality is, is when the Lord speaks to them, they come. Take an interest in that person, and then I'll tell you what will happen. They'll want to have what you have because they see that person ain't all religious. It's true. Like we talked about the Lord for like Bible study for two hours. Then we went to in and out. We talked some more and it was like, man, I love talking about Jesus. But, you know, the Holy Ghost at times, you know, he'll direct you in other areas. Because you don't even want to overwhelm people. 
You got to give that people that opportunity to make that transition. See, it'll be a lot better if that brother comes back and he steps forward and comes into Christ than if I drag him kicking and screaming. Amen. You all right? Challenge, no. Let me expand that. <laughs> Amen. It's all right. Hang in there. All right. Here we go. The last verse we close, Psalms 27. Here's a good point. Thank you, Caleb. Hey, you give me all kinds of points today. Like yesterday, we spent the whole day training baseball. And my son doesn't understand the commitment it takes for me to take a whole day to invest in him to play baseball so he can get to the next level. But he went to two little practices in the morning. And then he said, oh, I think I, I, think I, I, I practiced enough today. He did practice enough if you want to be normal, if you want to be average. Pat knows, huh? It, but if you want to be like the kid he knows, who's the starting shortstop for Cal Berkeley, who I coached, who was on my team, is the same age as my son, my older son, who's, who's just as good probably to me. The other kid's probably way better now because he's practicing, he's training, he's on it. But see, if you want to get to that, that level of excellence, then it takes a lot more commitment. And that's what I told them. See, while the other little boys are out there hanging out on the corner, riding the bicycles, blunting, they're all there. There's all kinds of things to invest your time in. But you can't invest your time in everything and think you're going to have excellence. No, don't work like that for anybody, spiritual or natural. And so I said, that this is what a Saturday looks like. When you, but, but later, when you're like bum gardener and you're signing a healthy contract and, and you're getting paid to do what you love to do, you look back on those days and you go, hey, thank you, Dad. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Man, I was, I was stupid. I wasn't listening. Thank you, man, that you did. I guarantee you. Go talk to any MLB person and ask them what role their father played in helping. I heard Mike Trout, he signed the largest contract. It was like 465 million. That's just what he makes playing baseball. That don't include his shoes, shirts, jerseys, whatever else, 465. And, and I, I heard him, he goes, oh yeah, well my dad, his dad never was as, way, as good as him, but he said, oh, yeah, my dad always took me to things, invested in me and time. It, it's on ESPN. Go look on it. This is years ago, the interview. Well, that, that 465. <laughs> I mean, someone says, that's just money. I don't care about all that. Okay, you make a dollar. <laughs> I mean, if I say you can make 465 million or you can make, you know, 60,000 working for the city of San Francisco, what are you going to choose? I mean, you have to be an idiot not to choose a 465. You have to be an idiot. And there's always some religious crackpot that's like that. They'd be like, well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Like this guy Friday night said that. And I was driving home with my friend and I go, brother, that is a true statement, but that is not a true revelation. Come on now. You and I, does that sound good to your spirit? The Lord giveth and the Lord takes. Well, that doesn't even sit with me right. Job said that, didn't he? He said it, but is, is that God's heart? No. Come on. The Lord don't take away. You might give away. Hey, you, you give it up. Who took it from Job? Satan. So you might allow the devil to take some things for you, but God didn't take it. How come God gets all the blame on everything? I mean, even Adam and Eve went, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me. I mean, the woman you get. We're always looking to put it on someone else, aren't we? Amen. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.